I have absolutely got my work cut out for me today. This piece was free on Marketplace, you can see why. <laughs> this is your pretty standard Danish domino molder piece. It is teak veneer, it is extremely rough, the finish is atrocious. There are gouges and scrapes and slices and a big hole, areas where the veneer is gone, and along with paint and a bunch of other scratches and scrapes. So. I'm not sure yet what I'm going to be able to do for this piece, but I am going to try to restore it, so let's get into this. My name is Angie and I refinish furniture. Sometimes I paint and sometimes I don't, but I always do what I can to save old pieces from the trash. Welcome to my workroom. I'm getting started by pulling out the drawers, inspecting them, making sure that everything is solid and intact, and they do all appear to be in good shape. This hardware does not come off, it is not screwed on, it's affixed with a dowel, so I'm going to have to leave it in while I refinish around it, basically. I'm popping out this brass keyhole escutcheon. Keyhole escutcheon. Well, the point is, I'm taking it out so that I don't damage it while I'm refinishing, and I'm just popping some tape in there, just to keep dust and oil out of that keyhole. This little project dresser will make a great workbench while I'm working on this. It's just the right height for me to be able to get at things easily without killing my back. What's interesting about this desk is that it's been modified at some point. This leg assembly here on the right isn't normally affixed with these brackets. These were added on by one of the previous owners. Now, the little stack of drawers you saw on the left side, there was a matching section on the right side that was removed years ago, I was told. So while this desk isn't technically complete, I actually kind of like it because it's going to leave more space on the right side for the chair. In order to refinish all of these pieces, I need to completely disassemble the piece, so I'm taking off all of the legs, the drawer box, I'm not sure what it's called, that has to come off. I'm hoping when I put this back together I won't need any of these little white brackets. They weren't meant to be there initially, the piece should structurally be strong enough to survive without it, so we're going to see how that goes. I've refinished several of these desks before, but I haven't fully taken one apart yet, and it's interesting how this box that houses the drawers is attached. There's this strip of wood in the back with these two bolts, and it just bolts on, and then there's one single screw that goes into one of the legs, and that's how it all stays together, which doesn't seem that sturdy, but when these are all put together and they're tight, they're pretty good. Obviously, they're still around, so they did something right. <laughs> So usually when I'm refinishing a desk or a tabletop, I like to take these boards off, but you can see here they're not screwed on. I don't know what these are called, I see them often, they're little metal things that just clamp into the wood. So I can't take these boards off, so I'm going to have to try to refinish them while they're attached. I didn't strip this finish because I knew it was going to come off pretty easily. It was failing in many spots, so I just grabbed a 150 grit sand pad. Definitely wouldn't want to go any harsher than that because these pieces are notorious for having fairly thin veneer. It's beautiful teak veneer, but it is quite thin, so you have to be really careful when refinishing it. It would have almost been a waste of time to strip it because the finish was just not thick enough to really warrant the time and effort. I'm not trying to get every little scratching gouge out with this 150 grit. I am going to go with a finer grit later on and refine it a bit. That is definitely a mistake that a lot of beginners do is they take their first grit, whatever they're starting with, and they try to get every scratch out with it. And by the time you get to your final grit, you've already eaten through too much of the veneer. Now these edges are, were super damaged, so I knew that I was going to indeed sand through some of the veneer in some spots, which was obviously less than ideal, but there was so much damage here. So I'm just trying to be as careful as possible and minimize that as much as I can. These legs, on the other hand, are solid teak, so I can be a little bit more aggressive with them and get out as many of the gouges and dings as I can on the first go.
these are actually really great shots of just how thin that veneer is. You have to be so careful. And that's why I started off with a 150 grit. I wouldn't even think about touching this with something like an 80 or even 100. It's just gonna eat too much too fast and yeah, you'll go right through that veneer. So now for the difficult task of trying to fix this hole. If this was a solid wood desk, I would absolutely cut a round hole. I would have cut through this and made a plug the same size and tried to fill it that way. But because the, in, the inner bits of this is pressed wood, I'm using wood epoxy. So wood epoxy is so strong. It works really well in situations like this. However, it does have limitations. It's essentially a type of plastic and you can't stain it. You can put stain over it, <laughs> but the second you go to wipe it, it's gonna wipe right off. So what I'm doing, once it's dried, I'm gonna go in with this teak wood filler and I'm gonna do wood filler just on the top bit so I can stain it. Wood filler is not easy to stain and I'm not super optimistic that my color matching is going to be perfect. You will still see the hole or where the hole was. You will still see the repair. Another thing I could have tried to do was square out where the hole is, like cut a square into the veneer, remove the little excess bits, used epoxy wood up to the level of where the veneer would start, and then put a veneer patch in. That would have been also ideal, but I don't have any teak veneer on hand to do that with, so I'm just trying to make do with what I have. It's not ideal, no, but I'm still saving this piece, so I'm okay with it. The edge where the side piece of veneer and the top piece meet is usually quite fragile, so I like to hand sand there where I can. If I were to hit this with a machine, it would undoubtedly go right through. Before I started using Odie's oil, I would typically do something like a lacquer, a spray lacquer, or Danish oil on a piece like this. This is actually the first piece of teak that I've done using Odie's oil, and I am already in love. Look at this beautiful color it's bringing out. I love Odie's oil because it is so much safer than a lot of the products that I have been using. It's non-toxic, it smells amazing. Best of all, it does a really good job of bringing out the beauty of the wood, protecting it. It is a bit of a longer cure time, it's about 30 days before it's fully cured, but once it's fully cured, it actually offers wonderful protection, especially from water. It becomes quite um, water resistant once it's cured. And it's super easy to do spot touch-ups and repairs down the road. It's applied using one of these little Merca Merlon pads. It's basically an abrasive pad, however, it is extremely fine. So on this piece, I sanded to, I think it was 220. I'm actually using an 800 grit Merca Merlon pad. So that's an important thing to note. You always wanna make sure that your application pad is a much higher grit than the last pad you sanded to, or you're gonna leave scratches in your wood. So basically you just put all this on. A little goes a long way. In fact, if you use too much, not only is it a waste of product and money, it actually makes it harder to take off. And this is a product that you put on and then you remove all of it. And what is left has soaked into the wood, it eventually bonds with the wood and that's what gives you that amazing protection. Once you've applied it, you want to just set it aside for an hour or two, move on to other things. In this case, I'm moving on to cleaning the inside of the drawers. And then once that time is up, you go back and you basically buff it all off. The sides of these drawers weren't initially sealed, but they looked a little thirsty, so I'm going in and putting some Odiso on those as well. This top has been drying while I've been 
finishing up and oiling all the other sections. The same as the other pieces, I'm doing a 220 grit here for my final sanding, and I'll take some time here and try to get out as many of the scratches as possible. There are definitely some that I can't remove, and <laughs> one of the things about doing this as a job is that you have to sometimes understand and realize that you can't get things perfect. And actually, it's kind of interesting because I was just watching a video last night by Dashner, who is one of my favorite YouTubers, and he basically said the same thing, and it holds true for me as well, in that sometimes we just have to realize that we can't always get everything perfect. And, you know, this piece is oh gosh, probably 50, 60 years old by now. You have to sort of accept the fact that they were going to be imperfections and that's just the way it is. <laughs> I added my second layer of filler here. I've already sanded the whole top except for that little spot. I'll just redo that corner, but I'm using a stain touch-up marker to just go over the areas that I have used wood filler and it will help blend the color a little bit more once I apply the ODs. So here the ODs has been sitting for about two hours. I'm using just a shop towel to buff it off and it has such a beautiful warm glow. It's not, I don't want to say it's not the easiest product to use because it's not hard. It's just very, very different than what most of us are used to using. Um, it's a lot more involved. You're kind of really literally hands-on. Like, just look at the finish. It speaks for itself, really. I still haven't oiled the top yet, but it's time to put the rest of this piece together. I've got the legs, I'm putting, well actually Andrea is putting some felt pads on the bottom just to protect the floor of whoever buys this. Willie Hatfield, <laughs> this kitty here, is looking onward. He's our shop foreman. Willow's around somewhere, I'm not sure where she is at the moment. So I've reassembled the rest of the desk. I am ready to apply the ODs to the top and it's a great sort of bird's eye view of just what a difference it makes in the color and bringing out the grain. Like it's just a wonderful product. Oh and like I said before in a few other videos, I'm not sponsored by ODs. I just really like the product so I get asked that every now and then. Just wanted to clarify, I'm not sponsored by ODs. I haven't oiled the front lip yet, but even so, you can see here on the top bit there is still some discoloration, so I'm just going in with some gel stain and just trying to touch up that color a little bit. It's not going to be perfect, but I'm just trying to help it blend in a little bit more. This area is where it was extremely chewed up in the beginning and there was some missing veneer there anyway, and then you've got the filler on top of it, so this little bit of gel stain will just sort of help camouflage that a little bit. I picked up this mid-century teak chair, oh my gosh, months ago, and it's been sitting in my storage room waiting for a teak desk. This is the perfect one. This chair does not need full refinishing. What I'm doing is using the same um, fine abrasive pad and some Odie's oil to kind of just give it a touch up. There's some paint splatter here and there. This will help pull that off. And what I can't get off with this pad, I can actually go in and use a 220 grit piece of sandpaper. So you can see here, I'm going in just to get off this stubborn paint, scratch off what I need to, and then go over it with the Odie's it's absolutely seamless and that's what I love about Odie's. You can't do that on every finish. You have to be sure that there's no stain on the product and it really depends on what they used as a finish. But on something like this that was probably finished with some sort of a Danish oil, which is actually a mixture of oil and varnish, it actually works quite well. And it's not just wood that you can use Odie's on. Odie's is amazing on leather, vinyl, you can use it on concrete, on metal. In this case here, obviously I'm using it on the vinyl seat here. And it's just going to completely renew this. I actually used Odie's in my Jeep not that long ago and it did a fantastic job. It is not greasy, so it was one of the few oils I could actually use on my steering wheel. 
So my Odie's oil has set up overnight. I'm going in with Odie's wood butter just on the top. Basically this is sort of a blend between the Odie's universal oil and the wax. It's a little bit softer than a wax and obviously harder than the Odie's oil. And what it's going to do, it's going to add a little extra sheen, a little extra protection, and going to make this top really sing. I don't know about you, but I am more than ready to see this piece fully finished. Look at what I started with. What a disaster. Like I said, it's not perfect. There are things I could have done to make it better, like using actual pieces of veneer inlaid into the hole to make it all wood. I ended up having to fill it. It's just what I had to do. I could have used oxalic acid on the ring. I didn't. It wasn't terribly dark after sanding, and yeah, it's not perfect, but you won't believe your eyes. <laughs> 